Right, good morning everyone. I'll hand over Jen to Jen to kick off the session. Thanks Rebecca. Good morning everyone. My name is Jennifer Gallagher and I head up the corporate team in Freaks Liverpool office. I hope you're all well and thank you for joining us this morning. On behalf of Freaks and the Knowsley Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of webinars and seminars with applied futurist Tom Cheesewright on future-proofing your business. We feel very privileged to have Tom with us today, who, as you may know, helps organisations around the world to see the future more clearly, share their vision and respond with innovation. Tom works with some of the leading global brands such as BP, LG, Nikon and Unilever to help them better understand what's next, allowing them to stay one step ahead of their competitors. As we know, it's never been more important for business leaders to look at the future so that their business can remain agile and ready to adapt to unprecedented change. We at Freaths have worked closely with Tom over the last four years in helping our clients better understand what's on the horizon so that they can create long-term strategies that will help them continue to grow and stay competitive in, some, in sometimes challenging markets. As part of this series, Freaths would like to offer you a complimentary 30-minute business consultation to help you realise your future plans to evolve and grow. To book your space, please contact rebecca.pearson at freaths.co.uk. We'll be circulating an email shortly after today's webinar, which will include further details on how to book. I will be passing you over to Neil Roscoe and Tom shortly, but before I do, we'll be holding a Q&A at the end of today's talk, which will be chaired by Michael McNally my colleague and Head of Employment at the Freeth Liverpool office. Please could I ask you to send your questions through on the chat box function as they arise during the session with Zoom to Michael McNally. There is also an option to send this to Michael privately. If you'd like to stay anonymous, please indicate this at the end of your question and we'll endeavour to answer all of your questions. But those that we cannot today, we'll come back to you independently over the next few days. Now I'm pleased to pass you over to Neil to introduce Nosley Chamber. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're delighted to co-host uh, this event today with Freaks uh, and uh, delighted that Tom's been able to, to uh, host it for us today. Uh, Nosley Chamber uh, was the sort of one front door for the business and business support in Nosley. Uh, we work very closely with uh, Nosley Council uh, and their business support team, Inward Investment Team and Town Centre Management Team in one office uh, in Nosley um, so we can work together and get the best for any business in Nosley. We have over 300 members including Freaks and we do events like this uh, quite regularly and our website and our e-newsletters are very popular uh, and we do a lot of good work in Nosley helping businesses to, to grow. Um, so uh, without further ado I will hand over to Tom who will uh, kick start the session. Thanks Neil and thanks Jen and good morning everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Tom Cheeswright. I'm an applied futurist. What that means is I work with organisations around the world to really help them answer three questions. First of all, what does our future look like? And particularly focus on the next two to five years, the things on the near horizon that might take your business out of the knees or present an enormous opportunity. I then get involved in storytelling around those visions of the future. Uh, it's no good having a vision if you can't then communicate it to people who need to make change, whether that's your staff or your customers, and your board or your shareholders. And then thirdly, I get involved in, in answering the really big question. You've shown us this vision of the future. You've convinced us of the need for change. Now, what on earth do we do about it? And so I get involved in organisational change. Now, the things I'm going to talk about today are really based on my new book, Future Proof Your Business. This book was meant to come out at uh, the end of July. Uh, and then with the COVID-19 crisis hit, my publishers rang me up and said, look, we think this is really relevant to the challenges people are facing now. Uh, would you be happy to bring it forward? Uh, and this was on a Thursday afternoon. I said, when are you thinking of launching it? They said, Tuesday. Um, so it's been a very accelerated launch. Um, it's great to be able to get out and do these sort of virtual book tour events and talk to you uh, in your own home or at work about what we're talking about here. And so we're gonna talk about really four things today, four sort of core principles in the business, or rather one core principle uh, and three techniques. One change in the business philosophy that I think a lot of us are going through now or need to go through. And then three practical tips about how you can future-proof a business. 
I was going to start with that philosophy because it's really important to understand if there's going to be one thing I'd like you to take away from this talk above all else it's this critical shift in business philosophy that so many of us are having to go through now and if we're not we really should be looking at and it starts with an understanding of, of what's driven business success for really the last 40 or 50 years if you went to business school if you've done an MBA if you've been in any large organization or any successful organization what you tend to find there's been a really strong focus on optimization on understanding what the business does and learning how to do it better where better typically means with more growth more profitability maybe fewer resources and over a period of time through optimizing our processes and our business models we've built some really amazing businesses and um, but it's it's a bit um it, it's a bit short sighted in this period and I, and I sort of say, I, I, I may call it a bit like uh, a bit like Joe Wicks of uh, a bit Joe, like Joe Wicks uh, uh, ethos if you like you know Joe's all about being lean and lots of us have been doing uh, our sort of Joe Wicks in the mornings with our kids I've been doing it this morning since we missed yesterday's and you know, we, we're focused on getting leaner and leaner and leaner and we, 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 we like it for our bodies we like it for our businesses building these incredibly lean businesses the problem is, is, it, is when the time comes that actually being lean is an issue, when you're so focused on stripping away the fat or being hyper-focused on being perfect at what you did and somebody doesn't want it anymore, when the customer changes, the competition changes, the market changes, and you're so well optimized for the way the world was, it's really, really hard to change for the way the world is. And so I was going to you know, suggest this this critical shift in philosophy that's going on right now this shift in business philosophy that we all have to follow it's this is that we've built a lot of our success over the last 40 or 50 years certainly in a lot of the organizations i work with through optimization by getting better and better at what we do by doing better tomorrow what we did yesterday doing it more efficiently and more profitably but in doing so and becoming so lean we stripped away a lot of the things that allowed us to adapt and what's really critical now is that we focus on making our organizations adaptable. And the reason for this is not just these giant waves of change that are flowing through the entire world and every industry, like COVID-19. But even before that, what we were seeing were these high frequency waves of change that were disrupting individual industries. We were seeing new paradigms, new business models, new technologies appearing on the near horizon and turning industries on their head. And we've seen it in music, one of the industries I studied quite closely a few years ago. We've seen it in media and publishing. We've seen it in commerce, and retail. And more recently, we've seen it in the automotive industry, in the banking industry. New ways of doing things, international competition, new technologies all coming together to drive very, very rapid change in these industries. And so whatever industry you're in now, whether you're thinking about global ways of change like the COVID-19 pandemic, or industry specific disruptions based on new technology and international competition, you've got to be focused now on adaptation, not optimization. That's the really critical shift. Now, if you buy into that argument, the question becomes, how do you do that? How do I build an organization that is flexible, that is resilient, that is adaptable? And this is what most of the new books are about. It's about these three techniques. And I, and I talk about these techniques in, in the context of of, again to a rather Joe Wicks related how do we build a more athletic business one that's not necessarily the leanest one but the one that's got all those characteristics that are you'd associate with the performance of great athletes now as my performance in, in, in sort of P with Joe demonstrates I'm not a great athlete but if you speak to people who are and I've had this conversation with some, some interesting athletes over the past few years people like Chris Akibusi you see some things that they do differently, that, they, that differentiate them from the normal human beings amongst us. For a start, they just seem to have better senses than we do. They've got this incredible sort of proprioception for what's going on around them, whether that's knowing exactly where that runner is off their back shoulder, or being able to actually know that their winger's making that run down the left channel and they can pop that 40 yard pass on their boot without barely looking up. The second thing these graphics have is the ability to make decisions really, really quickly. They process all, that, process all that data from what's going on around them, and they translate it into action really, really fast. And that's something we need to learn in our businesses. And the third thing these athletes do is they train for the game that they're in. If you took the greatest footballers from the 1970s and parachuted them into the Premier League today, they would be lost. They would fail 
because for all their possible ball skill, their bodies just aren't in shape for the game they're in. And so we have to look at the structure of our organizations, the shape of our organizations, and change those to be fit for the game that we're playing today in business rather than the game we're playing 10, 20, 30 years ago. So let me get into each of these in a bit more detail. The first one is about senses. And there's a number of different types of senses that are really important in business. You've got to really close to the customers and understand what's going there, close to your partners and see what's going on in your supply chain. But you've also got to have that ability to look forward. So what I guess is the business equivalent of that football brain we sometimes talk about, the ability to see what's coming to read the game. And lots of us in business are really, really bad at this, in part because we don't have the time to do it. Most organizations I go into, everyone's so busy focusing on keeping the business ticking over on the day to day that they spend very little time thinking about the future. And even when we do think about the future, we often don't do it very well. Uh, I did some work a few years ago with a Canadian software company. and We surveyed loads of finance directors and chief finance officers around the world. We found that in two thirds of organizations, the annual strategy and the annual budget just don't match up. You know, at best, they share some of the same headings. In many of the cases, they don't align at all. So the one time every year we're really thinking about future in our annual strategy, our annual budget, we're not even putting the money behind our objective. So how do we change this? And my argument is that everybody, every leader in an organization ought to be spending 1% of their time thinking about the future. That translates into roughly a day every six months. And when you do that, when you carve out that day, you really need a formalized process to do it. Because otherwise you just get sucked back into the day to day. And actually a lot of your existing assumptions you know, most people in a leadership position are experts in their industry and they know lots about it. So it's very easy to fall back on those assumptions and ignore what's going on outside. A formal process helps you to break out those of that shell, take off those blinkers and see what's coming. And the way you do this is you look, first of all, for the pressure points in your organization. What is already causing you pain? What are the issues that you're facing? And you do this by asking questions. You go and talk to everybody in your organization from the bottom to the top, and you say, what stops you being as productive as you could be? What frustrates you? you? Go and talk to your customers and say, what don't you like about us? What could we do better? What could we do differently? Go and talk to your partners in the supply chain. Go and talk to your lawyers or your accountants or your marketing consultants, your marketing agencies, and say, what's wrong? What's painful? What don't we do well? And quite often what you'll find is it's a really cathartic process. People like releasing this information, particularly people inside your organization. And they'll tell you things, you, lots of things you didn't know already. And what you end up with is this list of things, this list of really cracks in the organization that might look small now, but when they're impacted by these big incoming trends could get wider and wider and wider and start to cause a big problem. And typically when you get these big trends coming in that transform all our lives and all our businesses, the place they tend to land is in those cracks. So you start with this cathartic process of capturing those pressure points, and then you go and look at what the macro trends might be that might change your world. And in my book, I list five, but really you can get a good sense of what the macro trends are by looking at what's going on in adjacent industries to yours. Go and read Wired magazine. Go and look at what Amazon and Facebook and Google are doing. Go and look at what's happening in China and the transformations that are going on there. And you get a sense for all sorts of transformations driven by technology and culture. But build yourself a list and match it against your pressure points and say, look, I've seen this trend happening in adjacent industries. What would happen if that interacted with the pressure point we're already facing around the lack of skilled people, difficulty in recruitment, or you know, excess cost in some legacy infrastructure. And what you end up with is a list of these intersections between the two. And then you just have to put a scale on them, work out how big is it really? What would it cost me in pounds and pence or people? And, list, and, and rank them. Pick your top five at the end of your one day taken out to look at the future. Pick your top five, put them on your existential to-do list. The top of your to-do list are things that if you don't deal with them are gonna give your competitors a march or cause you serious problems and deal with them over the next six months. And then in six months time, repeat the process. Now, once you've got those things on your to-do list, it's no good having them unless you can take a decision and do something about them. And this is again, something a lot of organizations I speak to really, really struggle with. They find the information moves very slowly through the organization. But there's a lot of people sort of passing their buck and not wanting to take responsibility for taking decisions. And so the company say, well, what's the answer? I say, we can do two things. You can keep all the decision-making, all the power at the heart of the organization and just speed up the flow of information. And there's lots of great technology out there now. You can make changes to your processes to speed the flow of information 
those decision makers, maybe it's you, at the heart of the organization. And actually that technology typically is a lot cheaper than people think it is now. Uh, things like accelerating the flow of financial information, making it clearer, stripping away all those awkward spreadsheets everyone's working on. You know, that can maybe be a few tens of thousands of pounds. Sounds like a lot, but if it frees up loads of people and loads of time, it can pay itself back very, very quickly. But there's something much simpler, albeit not necessarily cheaper, that you can do, which is stop hoarding all that power at the heart of the organization and push power to the edge of the organization so that when information comes in, you can act on it really quickly, or rather the person at the edge of the organization can. Now, this takes investment in training. It takes investment in building a, a solid set of rules around people so they know the boundaries within, within which they can operate. It takes changing culture so you can give people the autonomy and the responsibility they need to act. But if you can do it, it's incredibly powerful. And I like to tell a story to illustrate this, and it's a story from 2015 about Lidl, the uh, discounter supermarket, which back in 2015, given its recent rapid growth, wasn't anywhere near as uh, powerful as it is today. And they weren't known for having branded goods on the shelves. In fact, they were known for having uh, quite unusual German brands on the shelves, which is great for us because Lidl's actually from the part of Germany where my wife comes from. So it's basically the delicacies that she, delicacies that she grew up with. But in 2015, they rolled out this big new line. It was Easter and they rolled out One Direction Easter eggs. And this was a big thing for them. So they're promoting it very, very heavily. And then disaster strikes. I'm sorry if this is triggering for any One Direction fans, but Zayn left. Zayn left the band. And this information came in through social media to their social media manager who looked at this, read it, had a little weep, and then turned to his colleague, the uh, merchandising manager, and said, look, We've got these One Direction Easter eggs on the shelves, one fifth of the band's on, what we're going to do? And he said, well, one fifth of the band's gone, we can knock one fifth of the price off. And he said, brilliant, I can work with that. And the social media manager crafts this tweet that captures the hearts and attention of One Direction fans who flood into stores, leave with their One Direction Easter eggs, and a warm, fuzzy feeling about Lidl the brand. Now, what's incredible about this story is that whole process, that whole process from information coming in via Twitter to big commercial decisions being made, to the information going back out on social media and across the network of stores in the UK, took a grand total of 20 minutes. And that decision was taken by two junior members of staff in their early 20s. Two junior members of staff given the autonomy and the responsibility to make big commercial decisions, responding at incredible speed. And I only realized, I think, quite how dramatic this was when a few years later, I bumped into a non-exec director of one of the other big supermarkets uh, and told her this story. And she told me it would have taken them three days to make the same scale of decision. So push power to the edge of the organization. Now, the last thing we have to do, as I said, is get the organizing, is organization into shape for the 21st century, into shape for the 2020s and beyond, where this adaptation is so important compared to optimization. Excuse me. Always the landline going. Still got some old technology. Um, You've got to get the organization into shape for the, for the 21st century where adaptation is so much more important than optimization. And the way you do that is look at the organization itself. Over the, those, this period where we've focused on optimization, we tend to build these sort of monoliths, these tightly integrated organizations that are focused on what they used to do on their old approach to things. And instead, what we need to build is something much more flexible. And the best analogy for this is probably Lego. So let me explain this using a slide that I created for one of my clients, Audi. Rewind to the 1980s, and you've got a child who's obsessed with cars, and particularly with rally cars, the multi-rally uh, winning Audi Quattro. And for Christmas, you're gonna buy them a model, a toy Audi Quattro. Now you've got two choices in front of you when you go to the toy shop. You've got the die-cast toy car, the one that looks just like the real thing. It's a perfectly optimized model. Or you've got the Lego one, which you really have to squint at for it to look like an Audi Quattro. Now, what happens after Christmas Day when you give the child one of these two cars? If you give them the perfectly optimized model, they're going to be really happy. It looks just like the real thing, scuds beautifully across the kitchen floor and gets under your feet. But sometime after you know, an hour, a day, a week, a month, if you're really lucky, they're probably going to get bored of this new toy. And when they do, it can't be anything else. It takes an enormous amount of energy to change this toy car, unless you allow your child you know, an angle grinder and some super glue, and I'm maybe giving an insight into my childhood here, it's gonna be very, very hard to change. Now, if you gave them the Lego toy car, the Lego Audi Quattro on day one, the moment they get bored with it, 
they can pull that thing to pieces and turn it into something else. It can be a dragon or a dinosaur or a unicorn or anything. And it takes very little energy to transform it into something else. So likewise, if their friends come around and their friends want to build something, they can take the door off the Audi Quattro and it can be the door on their car, or frankly, a building block in something completely different because the building blocks are common. And this is an approach that organizations around the world are starting to understand now, that actually lots of us have shared building blocks, that actually, if we can build our organization as a box of Lego bricks rather than a tightly integrated whole, when the time comes to make change, it's much easier to dynamically organize them, to build new blocks and put them on top, to bring in other people's blocks from outside, or you know, use other people's blocks, or share the blocks we have with other organizations. And the real masters of this are Amazon. You know, we may or may not like them for various reasons based on their behavior, but they understood this very early. You know, 16 years ago, Jeff Bezos at Amazon sent a memo out to everybody in the organization and said, stop talking to each other. Wrap every function in our organization in the digital equivalent of Lego bricks and give me a box of Lego I can play with so I can dynamically reorganize this organization to meet new challenges. And in doing so, created Amazon Web Services a little building block, a little Lego brick that organizations around the world use and now represents 80% of Amazon's profit because it's on what? It's the platform which so much of the internet is hosted, or the web rather. So to round up, the biggest thing I'd like to take away from today, if nothing else, is that we need to make this philosophical shift in business, that we can't keep growing and succeeding by just optimizing, by doing what we did yesterday better tomorrow. We have to look at adaptation and innovation. And the organizations that build sustainable success for the next 20 years are going to be the ones that learn to adapt. And how do we do that? First of all, we've got to improve our senses. We've got to have really good senses for what's going on immediately around us, but also really good senses for looking at the future. And the only way to do that is to carve out the time to do it and use a formalized process to look beyond the bounds of your own industry and see what's coming down the pipeline. We've got to accelerate our decision making. And we can do that by speeding the flow of information through the organization, but it's best done by pushing power to the edges. And we've got to change to shape our organization, turn them from these deeply integrated, highly polished monoliths into boxes of Lego bricks, which may be less efficient today, but are much more adaptable tomorrow. And so that's me. I'll uh, hand it over to Michael, I think, for, to uh, bring in some questions. Cheers, Tom. That was great. Um... So yeah, we've got a few um, questions for you. I suppose that the first one that I've got is, you mentioned a couple of great names there, Amazon, Audi. Um, in terms of, they're all big companies. Is this advice applicable to, to smaller SMEs? Yeah, I think it absolutely is. I mean, most organizations, like, you know, I've, I've, I've been there, I've run two or three SMEs, you know, well, particularly very small businesses, and I've worked with a lot of you know, organizations of all sizes. What you tend to see is in the, in the really early days when you're just getting started, you're very adaptable because you're casting around trying to find that what the, they call in the startup industry product market fit. You're trying to find you know, what works, what, what gets traction with your customers. But after that, we very rapidly lose this adaptability. And we're so focused, particularly in SMEs, actually on running the business. It's really, really hard to carve out time to think beyond and think about what's next. And, and then you know, we tend not to do it until pressure forces us to. You know, a great example recently has been you know, some of these organizations that really had no online presence, but realized very quickly when lockdown started, they weren't going to survive unless they built one. And so very rapidly built an online presence. But absolutely, you know, the, the same thing's true. I think if you're running a business, if you're out of that startup phase and you're running an established you know, and growing business, the, the, all the lessons are saying you've got to carve out time to focus on the future. You do that by you know, actually... Um, Delegating is one of the ways you do that and trusting the people around you and giving them all that autonomy and responsibility. And you've got to look at that shape of your organization. Don't think you have to build an organization the old way where you bring in people, bring in services and, and build it all up slowly. You know, think about how you can use that Lego brick approach to drop in functions as and when you need them. So I suppose a follow up for that is, it, would your advice be if I'm a small business owner, the place to start is actually to set aside some time to, to, to start this process. That is basically where, where you start with it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it, it's not so much setting aside, it's carving out. You know, there's a reason we're all busy. There's a reason we don't find the time to do this. What you have to do is, is look at your to-do list and work out how you can excise some of that and, and give it to people around you. you know, whether that is outsourcing some of it, you know, 
the, the moment you can afford to, you know, outsourcing some of the finance stuff and the bookkeeping, you know, taking on a virtual PA, which for a very small amount of money every month can actually free up an enormous amount of time, or actually, you know, giving more power and responsibility to other people around you in your organization. You know, and a lot of people say to me, particularly in small business, look, I just don't trust. I can't, you know, I love them, but I don't trust them necessarily. Mm. And that's where you have to start looking at investing in training and skills and coaching and development to start to develop those people around you until you can hand things off um, and, and you can do so with confidence. Okay, cheers. Um, any, anyone listening, if you do have a question, just we've had a few questions in, just put them in the chat box or the, or the Q&A um, and I can ask Tom um, those questions. What then, Tom, do, do you see as being the most important? <laughs> Sorry, Michael, I've lost you there. Can you hear me now? Yeah, back now. Okay. Um, in terms of skills, what, what type of skills would you suggest a business leader needs to have or develop to, yeah, this, to best implement this? Yeah, I, again, I think this is it's a set of skills that actually a lot of people in leadership have, but maybe haven't developed for a long time. Um, I did some research with the Institute of Chartered Accountants a few years ago, and we, we were looking really at what skills we ought to be teaching people at school. And what we realized by the end of the project was this is a, a fairly universal set of skills we ought to be developing in everybody, at every layer of the organization and every level of seniority. And the, the first one, the skills of discovery. Like you, you've got to be really good at recognizing where the gaps are in your organization, where the gaps are in your understanding, and actually the gaps are in your own learning and skills development. Um, and you know, the, that ability to sort of discover and qualify information is hugely important now. We're faced with so much more information than we ever have been before. Your customers are facing more information than they ever have been before. And actually doing, learning how to you know, sort of scan what's going on around you, find the useful nuggets of information, turn them into something of value. And particularly, as I say, where it comes down to what skills you're lacking, what are the, what are the gaps in your development or the development of people around you? That's absolutely critical. The second skill to develop is about actually communication. Um, we are increasingly, in the, the, one of the, the effects of this increasingly networked economy is that we're all operating in smaller, smaller units, which means that more of us are at the edge of those units, which means we tend to have more, need to spend more time communicating. And so the skills of communication in business have probably never been more important. And whether that's, you know, written communication, whether that's through design, whether that's public speaking, you know, all of those things we need to polish and hone all the time. And the last one's about creativity. You've got to actually kickstart those sort of those brain cells and actually the processes that help you to build new stuff and you know develop new stuff and not rely on the products and services that have maybe brought you to where you are today. And you know, there's a there's a really terrible culture around creativity in the UK that you're either creative or you're not. When actually your know, creativity is absolutely a muscle, it's something that can be developed and honed. Um, and increased and it's really about repetition it's about learning to try and fail and learn from that failure and innovation is a lot cheaper now than it ever has been it's much easier to get access to the knowledge the skills the tools to build new stuff and what I, what I quite often say to leaders particularly you know, people who are quite senior in their organization who maybe feel like these skills have atrophied a bit is, is go and get a new hobby and one thing I learned a few years ago my kids taught me into going roller skating with them is you you, you learn uh, all of these scrolls very, very quickly. The first thing you learn is some humility because um, having been an expert in your field and you're used to being the grown-up and the one making decisions, you're suddenly surrounded by, in my case, you know, seven-year-olds who are better than you at everything uh, on the rink. You, but you, you learn that discovering qualification very, very quickly. You learn actually what the gaps are in your skills. You learn to learn again. It really jumpstarts those learning muscles because you're watching other people, you're trying things out, you're getting creative with how you, whether it's, you know, whatever, whether you're, learning to paint or learning a sport, you're getting creative with actually testing these out, seeing what works and changing them. And you absolutely have to communicate quite often with a completely new um, set of people. Um, and so you know, if, if you feel like, if you are quite senior in your field, you feel like those skills of atrophy, you go and get a new hobby because it really jump starts all three all over again, those three C's, curation, creation, communication. Great, cheers Tom. Um, and you mentioned um, about looking at adjacent industries. Is there a particular industry or sector that you think does all of this well? Uh, no, in short. I mean, I think there's a huge variation across all the industries. And actually, quite often, some of the companies you'd think you'd look at and think they've got this nailed um, are struggling with it as well. We're all in a, in a time of change right now, and everybody's learning. 
you know, and I can't name them, but you know, believe me, you know, if you uh, two, I can tell you that you know, two or three of the massive global companies, the biggest names, and you could probably work out if you looked at my client list, ones that everybody think understand the future and have really got this nailed. They're asking very much similar questions. But, you know, I, I think you can look at some recent examples of companies that have really done interesting stuff. I mean, one of my favorites, I'm sorry, I'm in Manchester, not Liverpool, but um, uh, one of my favorites is, is Shindigger, the local brewery, which had a very limited online presence going into lockdown and was getting most of its sales through local beer shops and bars and very quickly turned its sort of, you know, its drayman over to delivery people um, and started and, and, and you know, upped its game online. And was doing you know delivery within two hours of crates of beer if you ordered online uh, and built up an enormous goodwill amongst people on you know during lockdown as a result of that so that, that ability to innovate really really quickly to see the challenge and what it means for you and respond to it really really fast i think you can find good examples all over the place okay yes and and looking at it more in a, a shorter term do you think smes could have learned from looking at China at the start of the, the, the lockdown and the pandemic, do you think there was things that they could have done looking to China back in say January, um, a couple of months before yeah. it hit here that, that they could have benefited them? Yeah, China's a really interesting example. Again, it's a bit like what I was saying about you know, some, some of the big guys. You know, we look at the Facebooks and the Googles, the Googles of this world, I think they've got it all nailed, but absolutely you know, they're facing the same sorts of challenges. You know, we look at China and see the pace of innovation there and the pace of response. Uh, and we think, wow, you know, that's that's really impressive. But you know, one of the other stories I like to tell is about um, the 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 hoverboard. You know, back again, back in 2015, you know, the hoverboard appeared, and um, Chinese you know, Chinese SMEs there ramped up really, really quickly to meet demand. They went from you know making a few of them and them costing a few thousand dollars to making millions of them and costing a few hundred dollars. But actually, even there, you know, those, some of those Chinese SMEs that we look at, sort of paragons of rapid adaptation, got caught out when that market collapsed again. Um, and quite a lot of small firms there went under getting caught out by, by not seeing what was coming. So, you know, I think we, we should absolutely be paying attention to what's happening in China. There's obviously a very different culture there, both in terms of you know, politically and socially. Um, but actually, the, 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 the ability to take new ideas and translate them into products and services in China um, is definitely operating at perhaps you know a, a good few hours, days, weeks, months faster than we do right now. And, and your book called "Future Proof Your Business," and the, 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 today's talk is. But the things you're talking about, do you think they're useful in? You've mentioned sports. Do you think they're useful for personal development careers? They can be adapted for that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I get pulled into all sorts of domains. The I think whatever you're doing, those three C's, those three skills are enormously important and enormously valuable. And certainly, you know, in terms of how I'm you know, trying to teach my kids, you know, those are the things I'm focusing on. You know, can they look at the world and understand what's going on? Can they take the resources around them and build something new? Can they then sell that idea to the people around them? I think those are really core critical skills. But, you know, the, the, the same, although the book is called Future Proof Your Business, actually some of the tools in it were originally developed working in the public sector. Um, so they're really sort of cross applicable. The, the framework for building more agile organizations was originally developed with one of the London Borough Councils um, and then translated and updated for a series of interactions with, with small and large businesses trying to adopt some of that methodology in different ways. So I think it really does have that, that sort of broad application. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, I've got one more question, and unless someone, anyone else um, puts anything in the QA box. But... In terms of the future then for business, um, what type of things, we heard a lot obviously about AI, um, what type of things would you say businesses should be looking towards and, and could be coming up in the, the middle to, to long term future? Yeah, I think one of the really critical things to understand is AI in the larger sense, which is really about automation. You know, we're getting to the point now where it's very, very cost effective to take out business processes, take out functions of business and hand them over to machines wholesale. And that doesn't mean necessarily replacing people. It means freeing people up to do the bits of things that only human beings can do that are enormously valuable. And in many ways, the more stuff we automate, the more valuable the human beings in an organization become because they can devote that time to relationship. They can devote that time to innovation. So if you're looking at your, your organization, whatever industry you're in, in some ways, there's probably quite a lot of stuff that human beings are doing now where the human beings could be freed up to do more valuable stuff. It doesn't matter if they're in finance or customer services or product development or sales 
know, there's a there's a bunch of really really simple tools out there that can ta- start to take some of the load off and free them to actually drive growth or you know, create more resilience. And that for me is one of the massive trends of the next 20 years. It's going to present some challenges because absolutely some jobs are going to go. Um, you look at some the field something like call centres. Uh, where we can build really, really good robot call centers now. Not many of us have experienced them. We're still getting the sort of dial nine and bang your head against the brick wall. But yeah, we can build these incredibly uh, emotionally aware call centers now, um, which can answer every call on the first ring, can answer an unlimited number of calls. Uh, and you know, in industries like that, we're going to see huge amounts of disruption. But what it really should do is create more value for the people rather than just displacing them. Well, that's great. Um, so I think that's all for the questions Tom, been really interesting um, I thought that was one more popping up so I'm just saying thank you very <laughs> insightful <laughs> but that was really good so th- thanks for the time Tom um, everyone watching I think we're gonna um, well this has been recorded so we'll send that to you via email and um, as Jen said we'll also send um, a follow-up email with some further information but thanks to everyone for coming and I hope that's been helpful and um, Go and carve out that time to future proof your business. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.